Dix. I uh, teach in the philosophy department here at Pierce College. Uh, my research interest, uh, at least the last few years, has been into the metaphysics of gender, the nature of gender, and how the a patriarchal society uh, actually influences the identity of gender in our lives. So. Hi, I'm Crystal Kiko. I'm Associate Dean of Student Success and Basic Skills here at Pierce College and a faculty advisor for the Gay Straight Alliance. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, um, my work is in um, campus climate for LGBTQ students and uh, community college campuses. Um, and what I examined for my uh, dissertation was uh, how those students view climate and how that uh, perception and those experiences affect students' uh, uh, engagement in educational and purposeful activities. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Carolyn Weiss. I am um, a uh, regional director for the Community Development Department, the Central West Region. Um, I've been a city employee now for almost 32 years. And uh, I came out to the world about uh, a little more than 12 months ago. And uh, ever since then, uh, my friend and, and colleague, Trian, uh, has kind of pushed me through a bunch of different uh, doors into advocacy, and uh, my life hasn't been quite the same since. Of course. As you'll have noticed, we have no mic, so please bear with us. If you can't hear, move closer. Make your ears better. I have no suggestions for you on that. <laughs> Paul Hicks is a member of the Psych Philosophy Department at Pierce College. He received his MA from California State University in 2008 with an emphasis of philosophy, religion, metaphysics, and ethics. Since leaving school, his research interests have focused on sex and gender with special attention to the metaphysics of gender. And he hopes to answer questions like the nature of gender, how do gender roles create identity, how does a patriarchal society influence both gender and sexuality? And how does pa patriarchy influence sexual intercourse? And now I present to you, Paul Hicks. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Thank you guys for showing up. Uh, this is certainly one of the uh, issues in philosophy and society that I'm really interested in uh, dealing with what exactly is gender, what exactly is sexual orientation, and how does that really influence the people that we are? How does that tell us who we are as a person, as an identity, as a self? What does it mean to be the I? Uh, my uh, general belief on that is that the self or the I, right, that soul or spirit, that mind, that thing that you are, right, outside of that physical skin and body, uh, is a conglomerate of social and political identities. And these are all constructed uh, from society, and for the most part, they're not natural, right? They, nature doesn't decide for us. Right? Nature does not tell us, uh, I, don't, I do not believe, whether or not we are a man or a woman. Now, I know a lot of students like to throw up their hands when I say this, because most of you, including myself, were raised in a society which says that if you have a penis, you're a man. And if you have a vagina, you're a woman, right? And that is supposed to be the end all and be all. And if in fact you have a penis or a vagina, then you're supposed to act in certain ways. You're supposed to behave in certain ways. You're supposed to um, sexually be attracted to you know, the opposite, right? The problem is, is that reality doesn't actually work out that way, <laughs> right? It just doesn't. Um, there's the sociologist, Harold Garfinkel uh, from UCLA uh, argued that there is this natural attitude towards gender. I don't know if I can sum up some of the characteristics for you. Is that there are two and only two genders. Most people seem to believe that, right? And that the essential determinant of gender is your genital status. And also that there are that gender is in fact invariant, meaning that whatever you're born with, penis or a vagina is what your gender is. You cannot change that. And also that everybody is born with either a penis or a vagina. Now he does happen to make a little note in one of his characteristics 
that where he says, any exceptions to this that might be given are not to be taken seriously. Well, I'm a philosopher. I take everything seriously. <laughs> uh, I don't accept this idea that, you know, if, if I've proven you wrong, then I've proven you wrong, haven't I? Right? If, I sh if I've shown you an example where your theory cannot account for, then there's something wrong with your theory. Right? And if your pre-theoretical theory about what the nature of gender is, this penis and vagina, is this natural attitude, then I can prove you wrong. Right? How? Well, a few ways. One, not everybody's born with a penis or a vagina. Right? There's a condition by which we call intersex. Right? Some people, uh, we're, you know, when we all start out in the womb, we all start out with the same template, right? which is often referred to as a female template. And then a protein activated by the Y chromosome uh, produces androgen. Well, this begins to differentiate uh, what the body actually does, or how the body actually forms. Not only um, mounds that will either form into a clitoris or a penis, uh, or you know, whether or not certain skin's actually gonna form into be uh, a scrotum, or it's going to form and be a labia, but also your brain is very heavily influenced at this time, especially in the first trimester, right? Your entire nervous system is being developed at this time. And sometimes, too much androgens released, sometimes not enough androgens released. And you can not only not just be on what would be typically seen as the male side or the female side, but you can get caught in between. And this is nature, guys. This is completely natural that this happens, right? Um, one of the things that I want to question, however, is why is it that certain characteristics are going to tell us what sex is, right? So we can differentiate a little bit between uh, biological or anatomical sex, and uh, the social construction of what gender is itself, right? So, biological sex. Some of the characteristics we often attribute to this are chromosomes, hormone levels, genital status, uh, etc. Uh, the presence of breasts or not. But, why is it we choose these? Really, why do we choose these given uh, characteristics? Because you know what? The brain also has characteristics, right? Certain parts of the brain have characteristics. And there are masculine and feminine parts of the brain, right? So what we could do is that if in fact, you know, assuming that you died, we can take your brain out. Right? It's, it's, not, it's a very messy process when you're still alive. But if we take your brain out and we actually examine the structures of your brain, we can tell certain things about it. We can tell certain things about you. Whether or not you considered yourself masculine, whether you considered yourself feminine, we can tell things about your sexual orientation. There's a, quite an array of information that simply brain structures tell us, right? Okay, well, what does this mean? Well, what it means is that biological sex, what we typically see, and to diagnose somebody as male or female, is penis or no penis, right? But, <clears throat> Why that? Why don't we diagnose with you know, parts of the brain instead? Why is it that we have to focus in on this given characteristic? Well, one answer to this, I believe, uh, is because of the human desire, uh, or at least for some humans, not all humans, uh, to reproduce, right? For, the, the, for a desire for some, uh, heterosexual engagement. Well. Not everybody's heterosexual, right? And not everybody's heterosexual in the same way. Well, if this is true, then not all people are going to fit in these socially constructed characteristics for the nature of gender. It simply isn't gonna happen, right? So we have found it, and you know, the, the feminist Monique Wittig you know, was brilliant in this, in the sense that she, examines that we've conceived and we have constructed these terms man woman and we say a man is this and a woman is that and we've done this for the purposes of heterosexual engagement but not everybody's heterosexual 
And so what happens is that if you fall outside of this, if you fall outside of these constructions, society doesn't take note of you. Society acts as if you do not exist. And societies have a way of punishing you, whether it's natural or not. Society has found ways to punish you for acting outside of this kind of binary, this expected binary that nature actually doesn't provide. Right? So for example, if you are given the gender assignment at birth of boy, and you grow up and you play with dolls, right? You're going to have uh, some censure, some deprivation, some sort of punishment of sorts, uh, possibly by your parents, by your siblings, or somebody. Right? And you're told immediately that's not acceptable. Right? But why is that not acceptable? <clears throat> Really, because you have a penis? I mean, really, is there, is, there some, is there supposed to be some sort of connection between the existence of what is between your legs, whether you're an innie or an outie, <laughs> right? And what type of toys you like to play with? But we don't just gender toys, do we? What else do we gender? Colors. Everything. <laughs> Colors. What's the boy color and what's the girl color for a baby? Blue. Boy is blue. Girls are? Pink. Why do we all know this? Because this is what society tells us. Exactly. It Not only do we gender this, but we gender food. Right? We gender music. We gender music. As I present as a man. And if you catch me going through the parking lot, you know, <clears throat> listening to Justin Bieber, <laughs> you're immediately going to put out some sort of category. And you're going to say, you're not really a man. There's something that you're not a man about, right? But if I was to present as a woman, and that's socially constructed woman, right, and listening to say Slayer. Awesome. Yeah. I love Slayer. Right? Right, the same kind of thing. What about drinks? Women have certain drinks, men have certain drinks. Right? If I go to a bar, and you see me at the end of the bar sipping on a blue drink with a little umbrella, right? Not really a manly drink. I'm supposed to drink Jack and Coke or beer, right? That's what men drink, right? So we have all these codes. We have all of these codes. And these codes are supposed to tell us things. They're supposed to tell us what is between your legs and whether or not you're going to engage in heterosexual intercourse, right? There is this nonverbal communication that's going on all the time, over and over and over again. We call them the codes of gender, right? How you dress, how you walk, how you sit, how you stand, what you eat, what you drink, everything. Everything is a code, right? And it's this type of language which is supposed to tell us certain things about you. But you know what? It doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't tell you a damn thing about me doesn't tell you anything about uh, if I'm heterosexual or not. It doesn't even tell you if I am heterosexual, what kind of heterosexual I am. Am I a top or a bottom? Right? What kind of sex do I like? It doesn't tell you any of that. Right? But it's supposed to. But it doesn't. It's false. Right? It's false language. All right. Well, society then tells us that we need to punish people who break these codes of gender. And there's different ways that we punish people. We can deny them entry into social, give them any social status. We will deny them health care. We will deny them jobs. We will deny them access into colleges and universities. We will deny them access to housing. We will deny them any social standing whatsoever. Now some of you might want to say, well look, this is a free country, this is a capitalist society. Right? You can hang out with who you want, you can associate with who you want. But what's the real problems with this? 